Well, good afternoon to you all. It's lovely to be with you. I always feel it's a bit of an anticlimax. You sing that hymn, you end on the note, here in the, 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 in the life of Christ I'll stand, and then the next thing you hear is sit down, which seems a bit of um, a contradiction. Uh, it's lovely to, to be with you. Thank you for, for caring about this issue that we're thinking about today. I'm very conscious that it's uh, a sensitive issue, probably for every single one of us. Uh, for many of us, it will be because this is an issue we have had personal experience with ourselves, but I'm sure for all of us, it's a sensitive issue because it touches lives that are very, very close to us. We will know friends, family members for whom this is a real issue, and I'm very conscious of that as we uh, begin our time together. Uh, for as long as I have had sexual feelings of any kind, they have been for men and not for women. Uh, I'm pretty slow, so it took me quite a few years uh, to realize that. But looking back, there were fairly clear indications along the way. I remember when I was about 14 or 15 at uh, high school, my, my best friend started dating. And uh, it was a Monday morning at school. We were catching up with each other's news over the, from the, the, the weekend. And he mentioned that he had just got together with this girl. And uh, everyone else was kind of congratulating him and high-fiving him and all that kind of thing. And I remember sort of smiling along but feeling absolutely crushed inside. I don't think I'd ever consciously thought of my friend in any kind of sexual way. But it was just unbearable to think that he was intimate with somebody else. I would clearly had a very strong emotional connection to him. And over the kind of months and years following that, I began to realize I was uh, developing in a way that was different to many of my friends. I didn't seem to have the same strong physical attraction for girls that they had. And it was painful. I was uh, at an all-boys school. This was 25 years ago before homosexuality was really on people's radar. And uh, there was lots of talk about girls I couldn't really relate to and I couldn't really join in with. Um, occasionally, uh, a friend would say to me, so who are you after? Is there a girl you've got your eye on or that you're pursuing? And uh, slightly embarrassed to share this, but I would make up someone because I wanted to fit in. So they'd say, who are you after, Sam? Is there anyone you like? And I'd say, yes, uh, Madeline. Yes, there's a girl called Madeline who I like, but you won't, you won't know her. Um, she's, you know, she's from Norway, and therefore <laughs> you won't ever, ever come across her. Um, I did try dating one or two girls at this time, thinking that might kind of help. But again, I just had no real romantic interest. And it was only when I kind of turned about 18 and finished school that I first began to say to myself consciously, I'm gay. And that was the time when I was beginning to prepare for, for life at university. And I remember thinking to myself, I could run with this at university. I could pursue this at university. No one back home would ever know. If this is something I want to kind of run with, that's the place to do it. Well, actually, as it, as it happened, about a month after that, I became a Christian. Uh, a friend had been bantering me to come to church for, for several months. I'd been refusing uh, for several months. I'd been doing pretty badly at school, and my parents uh, had said I was only allowed out one evening a week during school term, and I wasn't going to waste that one evening a week on anything to do with church. But when I finished school and had lots of spare time, I thought I'd go along. And I went to this youth meeting. Uh, an elderly man was giving the talk. He explained the gospel, and I'd never heard it before. I never knew Christianity was about God being kind to bad people. I just assumed it was God rewarding good people. And uh, very quickly, I gave my life to Christ. And from the beginning of my Christian life, I think I'd always known that Christians didn't believe in sex outside of marriage. And so I had a sense from the very start of my Christian walk that my, my homosexuality was not going to be something I could pursue if I was going to be a disciple of Jesus. But the fact was I still had those feelings. And I knew, or I felt at least, that, that, that was, they, were, they were deeply unchristian. And so I was deeply ashamed of them, and my strategy was, well, if I ignore them, they might go away. And I was desperate that no one else know what I was feeling. I just kept thinking to myself, well, I'm, 
I'm not supposed to have these feelings if I'm a Christian. Or I thought I'd be letting the side down if other people knew that I was experiencing these homosexual attractions. I was nervous I might lose my newly found Christian friends, that they wouldn't want to know me anymore if they knew the truth. And above all of that, I, I had this horrible feeling that if I, if I spoke of these feelings to somebody else, it would make them more real. And I was desperate for them not to be real. Well, as I got into my mid-twenties, it was just getting more and more painful. Um, I wasn't coping with it. And I began to realize for the first time, I, I, I actually need to tell someone what's going on because it, is, it was just churning me up inside. So I told my, my pastor at the time, and uh, over a period in, in slight fear and trembling, I started to tell my closest friends. And that made the, just the hugest difference to me. Uh, none of my friends was phased by it. And the fact that they didn't really react actually made me realize this, this issue isn't the end of the world. When I told my friends I was uh, sort of struggling with homosexual temptations, they would kind of go, ah, okay, well, it's good. thank you for sharing that, and you know, what can I do to help? And the sky didn't fall down, I didn't burst into flames, it wasn't the apocalypse, and therefore maybe this issue was going to be okay to deal with. Um, as a pastor now, I know the devil loves secrecy. Because if something is a, a secret battle, he can blow it out of all proportion. But actually, now that I have people who understood and were supporting me, it, it really helped to put the issue in perspective. And more than that, it made good friendships even deeper. Uh, the very act of sharing something that was very personal and very painful actually put my friendships on a much closer footing that, again, has been a great help ever since. And then a few years later, which is by now uh, about three years ago, I felt a burden to be more public about these uh, kinds of issues. I'd never had any desire to. These were my feelings, nothing to do with anybody else. I didn't want to be the SSA guy. But I kept seeing Christians who felt the gospel wasn't good news to gay people. And I had pastors that I knew well who were beginning to shift in their theology, beginning to change what they believed. And I felt a, a burden increasingly to share publicly that actually the, that God's word for people in my situation is a good word. Uh, it's not a bad deal to follow Jesus. And so about three years ago, I shared uh, with my church that I was someone who was, uh, had homosexual feelings and then began to share it a bit more widely. But what I want to spend um, the rest of our time uh, in this session looking at this uh, afternoon is, is flourishing in Christ with same-sex attraction. There'll be some of us who experience same-sex attraction, but there are a lot of other people who are Christians out there who do as well. And I'm being fairly subjective in this. I'm actually telling you what I need to hear. So I hope you don't mind me doing some ministry to me. If it helps you as well, that's a, an additional bonus. But these, I think, are things that uh, it is good for those of us with SSA to be aware of. And I have run this past a few other friends with this issue as well, just so it's not entirely subjective. So five quick things, and they get quicker as we go through, in case you're, you're worried about that. The first thing we need to know is that our identity is in Christ. Um, Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And my friends, it makes the world of difference to know that. Uh, as I understand it, one of the big things our, our culture around us is saying at the moment is that you are your sexuality. Your sexual feelings define you. They are who you are at the core of your being. They are you at your most you. And because that is the, the common belief, as you will know, that means everyone's sexuality has to be affirmed. Uh, if you don't affirm someone's sexuality, you're effectively rejecting who they are at their deepest level. And uh, where I come from, and I gather it's even more the case here, that is the unforgivable sin in our culture. And it is why non-affirming Christians 
and not just seen as, as wrong, not just seen as, as quaint, but increasingly we're seen as dangerous. Um, the, I think he's a gay rights campaigner and, and writer, Dan Savage, um, in one of his pieces, accused Christians of filling gay children with suicidal despair. And that is the context we find ourselves in. But I want to just outline a couple of quick problems with that whole kind of way of identifying and defining yourself. If you are your sexuality, then sexual fulfillment is key. Sexual and romantic fulfillment become everything. Being sexually fulfilled is, is intrinsic to being complete as a human being, if you are your sexuality. And so it makes the stakes incredibly high. And actually, the, the real, I think, tragedy of that is that the mean, it means the world ends up saying, in effect, that a life without sexual satisfaction is not a life worth living. The church doesn't say that, I hope. The scriptures don't say that, but our culture does. And I want to suggest humbly, and I hope graciously, that the world has more blood on its hands these days, I think, than the church does. And given that's the context, we have wonderfully good news about identity. Uh, Jesus actually does two things, I think, uh, when it comes to how we think about sex. Yes, he shows us the context in which sex is, is, uh, is designed to be a gift to us. But more than that, Jesus teaches us, and in his life, he shows us that sex and romantic fulfillment is not the key to making ourselves complete. Jesus was, after all, the most fully human and complete person who ever lived, and yet was celibate. So if we say that you have to be sexually fulfilled to be complete, we are denying the full humanity of Jesus. And on top of that, Jesus teaches actually a very different way to be fulfilled as a human being. Uh, Jesus shows us that actually it's as we're reconciled to the Father through him, that is what is designed to fill us. That is what is designed to satisfy us. And therefore, we as Christians need to see our identity in a very different way. I am not defined by my sin. I'm not defined by my temptations. I'm defined by who I am before God the Father in Jesus Christ. And friends, it is liberating to know this. I've been battling same-sex attraction for 25, 30 years now. I see the same kind of patterns emerging in my, in my feelings. And there are times as I'm battling against those temptations, there are times I can hear a voice saying, Sam, stop trying to be somebody else. This is who you are. Just accept it and run with it. This kind of trying to be celibate and chaste, that's just not you. But actually, as I open the Bible, I realize, realize that actually who I most truly, ultimately, and fundamentally am is someone who is in Christ. And therefore, when I'm striving to be holy, when I'm striving to be Christ-like, I'm not going against the grain of who I really am. I'm going with it. As someone who is in Christ, I am most being me when I am pursuing godliness, not when I'm pursuing sin. Your identity is in Christ. Secondly, discipleship is hard. Uh, when Jesus first arrives on the scene in Mark 1.15, his kind of campaign launch, for want of a better phrase, is this. He says publicly, he's, these are his first words in Mark 1.15, he says, the time has come the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus says that the response to his coming and what he's about to do 
is two things. We have to repent and we have to believe. And Jesus doesn't say that's the case for this group and not for that group. That's the case for humanity. And to repent, as you will know, is to turn around. It's to, it's to switch direction. Um, I was running some errands back home uh, just recently. I was walking along the main shopping street where I live. And whenever that happens, my brain goes into screensaver mode and I kind of forget what I'm meant to be doing. And I, I realized I'd walked straight past the shop I needed to visit. And being English, I thought, well, I can't just turn around on the middle of the sidewalk. People will think I'm strange. <laughs> you have no idea how exhausting it is being English, by the way. <laughs> so I thought, I've got two options here. I can either carry on walking, go into a shop for a moment, pretend to look at something, and then leave and come back. <laughs> or, and this is what I decided to do, I could cross the street, come back the other way, then cross the street. That's what I did. But either way... I needed to repent. I needed to, I was going that way and I needed to be going that way. And when Jesus says, as he does in a blanket statement, repent to everyone, Jesus is saying, all of us are lined up the wrong way. All of us are oriented spiritually in the wrong direction. And so Jesus doesn't have one message for opposite sex attracted people where he says, yeah, you guys are basically okay, you just need a bit of fine-tuning. And then a different message for same-sex attracted Christians, where he says, okay, you guys, yeah, you guys are just a bit worse, we've got to do a bit more work on you. No, Jesus says all of us need to reorient our lives at the most deepest level. And therefore, for any of us, discipleship is going to be costly. There's, discipleship is, is going to be hard. There are things we're going to have to turn around on that feel fundamental to who we are. Uh, in Mark 8, verse 34, Jesus says famously, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In other words, Jesus is not saying, I can add a few kind of spiritual frills around the edge of your life. No, denying yourself is exactly that. It is saying no to who you have thought you were all your life and saying yes to Jesus instead. That identity you have finessed and crafted over years has to be given over to Jesus. And friends, that is the case for all of us. I've had a number of occasions where I've, I've given a talk on homosexuality and Christianity, and I've had a Christian come up to me and say, well, yes, but, but it's, the gospel's harder for you, isn't it? Because it goes, it goes really against who you are. And I always want to say, well, actually, my, my sexual desires aren't who I am. Thank you very much. But secondly, if you think the gospel's just kind of slotted in neatly to your life, not really required any particular deep changes. I don't think it's the gospel of Jesus you've been, you've been receiving. And so if we're tempted to think the gospel is unfair to same-sex attracted people, it may well be that we haven't really counted the cost of discipleship in our own lives. Um, turn with me to, to John 15. This is a passage that has meant a lot to me over the years. If you've got a, a gadget or a, something called a book, do turn to John 15. I love it. It's been 2,000 years and we're back to scrolling through the Bible again. <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. John 15, Jesus says in verse 1, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. In other words, Jesus is the vine, we're the branches, God the Father is the gardener. And he is in the business of pruning his plants. And if you've ever seen someone who's no, who knows what they're doing, uh, pruning a tree, it looks like they hate the tree. Okay, they, they're just, they're not just, you know, short back and sides, nibbling around the edges. They are hacking away at the good stuff. And therefore, there are going to be times in our Christian lives when it feels like God has got it in for us when God is demanding things of us, when God is taking things from us that we 
feel like we can't bear to do without. And yet Jesus shows us in this passage that the one reason the Father prunes the branches is to make them more fruitful. Um, There have been a number of times in my journey where I have felt I have felt the sharp blade of the Father's pruning. Um, Actually, as it happens, just before Christmas, a couple of weeks before Christmas, I had a pretty big meltdown. Uh, Lots of anxiety, lots of depression, lots of feeling overwhelmed by, by everything as it happens. And I remember thinking at one point, you know, if God can use this to make me a bit more like Jesus then it will have been worth going through. I couldn't say that at every point. couldn't pray that every day. But it is true. And my experience has been that the things that have been most painful have often become in God's goodness a means of grace. And for for Christian brothers and sisters with same-sex attraction, the change that we most need... The change that is promised in the Bible is that we become more and more like Jesus. Not that we become more and more heterosexual, but that we become more and more Christ-like and holy. Discipleship is hard. Uh, Thirdly, and we're speeding up now, you'll be relieved to hear, God's Word is good. God's Word is good. Um, The way same-sex attraction seems to work in my life is that... um, what will often happen is there will be a, an emotional connection, a very deep friendship, and that will then become sexualized. I almost never see someone for the first time and feel sexual attraction. It almost always comes out of a sense of emotional attachment. Um, I will, I've always had just a, a deep longing for a, for a best friend I can kind of ride off into the sunset with. And so when friendships come along that feel like that, I find myself occasionally with these yearnings to kind of just take that person and be buddies with them forever and ever and would be best friends and they will get me and understand me and they will make me feel secure and full. And so a verse that has challenged me a lot is John 6 where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I've read that verse many times over the years. I used to read it as Jesus giving us another line of his resume. You know, I'm God the Son, I'm the Good Shepherd, I'm, I'm the Vine, and, by the way, I'm, I'm also the Bread of Life. And you think, oh, clever, good, wow, that's impressive. But actually, that verse has become more and more of a rebuke. It's not so much Jesus saying, oh, and I'm the Bread of Life as well, in case you didn't know that bit. It is Jesus saying to me, Sam, I am the Bread of Life. No one else, I am the Bread of Life. It has been a rebuke. Uh, God is saying to me through that verse, actually, it is only in Jesus that I'm designed to find satisfaction for my soul. It is in Jesus I am to find my ultimate security and refuge. God's word is good often because of the ways it contradicts us. Uh, David says in Psalm 19, I love this verse, he says, the commands of the Lord are radiant. Could you say that of the commands of anyone else in the universe? You're at work one day, your boss comes up to you and dumps a huge amount of stuff on your desk for you to do. Do you message your friend and say, do you know what? My boss has just given me a whole load of stuff to do, and you know, it is radiant. (laughs) Radiant, absolutely radiant. The commands of the Lord are radiant because the Lord is radiant. And therefore, as we walk in his ways, as we live in obedience to his word, actually doing that brings his goodness and love home to us. The danger is we think, well, I'm not going to obey that command because I don't like it. And it may well be the reason we don't like it is we're not obeying it. 
as we live by God's word, we see the goodness of God. We see the radiance of what he commands us. There is no one who knows me better than God. There is no one who loves me more than God. And therefore I can trust what he says to me. His word is sometimes infuriating, if I'm honest. It's often difficult, but it is always good. God's word is good. Number four, church is vital. Uh, find uh, Mark 10, if you would, verse uh, 29. Mark 10, verse 29, if you've got access to it. Um, I was having lunch with a, a mate of mine who is uh, not a Christian. He's in a long-term gay relationship. Uh, he'd come to a Christmas carol service and had said he wanted to meet up and talk about following Jesus. He said, is that all right? And I kind of thought, yes, yes, that's, that's, I can do that. That's good. Um, so I was sitting and, and having lunch with him. He, he was saying to me, you know, what does Jesus think about my relationship with my husband? And I, I tried as, as carefully and as graciously as possible to kind of walk him through what I understood Jesus to say about sex and marriage and all those sorts of things. And this friend of mine just kind of looked at me. He's the kind of guy who's got those, he's one of those guys who's got eyes that feel like they are just seeing straight through you. And he kind of blazed these eyes at me and said, Sam, my partner is the best thing that has ever happened to me. We've been together for over 20 years. What could possibly be worth giving up that relationship for? And I remember sitting there thinking, that's a good question, actually. And I remember thinking, okay, Lord, do us some help here. Give me some air cover. And I remember thinking, the answer surely has got to be more than, well, you get heaven one day. He was asking a, a real-time, here and now, down-to-earth, ground-level question, and I thought, I need a ground-level answer to this that's not just some kind of airy-fairy, there's, there's eternity. It's true, there is. And the verse that came to me was um, this exchange between Peter and Jesus. In verse 28, Peter says to Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. And we don't know Peter's tone of voice. We don't know if he's, if he's bragging. We're the guys, we've left it all, Jesus, for you. We don't know if he's despairing, saying, Jesus, we've kind of, we've kind of given up a lot here. This is, this is going to be worth it, right? But either way, Jesus answers in verse 29, and it's a wonderful verse. He says, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. It's a wonderful passage. Jesus assumes there will be things that we have to leave in order to follow him. And he assumes that the costliest of those things will be relational, will be familial. Uh, no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands. And there may well be that there are some relationships we have to leave behind to follow Jesus. In some cases, we don't get a choice in that. We are left behind by our, our kin and those around us. At other times, the, the relationship will need to be so radically reconfigured that in one sense, we're leaving it behind. But Jesus promises not, well, just grit your teeth and, and hang in there and wait for glory. No, Jesus says, now in this time, we will receive a hundredfold. Whatever it is we've had to leave behind, we will receive far more in godly kind and greater measure. And again, he casts this in relational language. Receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands, and yes, persecutions. But Jesus is promising primarily family. 
Jesus is saying whatever change you have to go through relationally as you come to follow him, Jesus is saying you should always feel a net increase in family by coming to Christ. And that is what we are meant to be providing as church. We're going to be hearing more about that later on. It's easy for those who've come from a gay background to feel homeless. They're not part of the community they've left, and they're not really people who feel like they fit in their church either. Uh, somebody once said, we can live without sex, but we can't live without intimacy. And therefore, our responsibility as churches is to fulfill this promise here in Mark 10, to make sure actually those who have left behind family receive far more, even in this life, than they've left behind. Jesus says it is never a bad deal to follow him. Never. Final thing as we close, the future is glorious. As we look ahead, when Jesus returns, when we experience and enter the new creation, what we long for now and never receive in fullness, we will experience perfectly then. There will be perfect intimacy. There will be perfect community in the new creation. We will be free from those unwanted desires, those unwanted temptations, those unwanted ten tendencies. We will have the perfect body. And therefore, it doesn't ultimately matter if I don't have those things in this life perfectly. It doesn't ultimately matter if I never have the body I always wanted, I will have a new body in the new creation. It doesn't ultimately matter if I don't have the marriage I've always dreamed of. I will be perfectly married. Christ to the church in the new creation. It doesn't ultimately matter if I don't have the deepest sense of community in this life. Paul reminds us the struggles we have in this world will not compare to the glory that is to come. It is hard in this life. But every hardship we experience, however deeply it hurts, is temporary. And the future is glorious. Amen.